afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third gathering of the Humanities Athenaeum at Tuxis. This is the third in our series of discussions on civil engagement and civic activity. I'm Rachel Highland, Reference and Collection Development Librarian here at Tuxis, and I'm privileged to be joined once again by my partners in this interdisciplinary inquiry. Bob Brown, Professor of History and English, and Dr. Raphael Fierro, Associate Professor of History. I have to apologize for the state of my voice. It's not the best for a moderator. I, uh, I know how many of you are struggling with this seemingly month-long cold slash flu slash whatever. <clears throat> I beg your pardon in advance, thank you. I must begin with thanks to Carol Mahmood, Chair of Humanities Department, who generously provided today's refreshments. Please help yourselves. And I personally want to thank the library staff for always being behind me in my efforts with the Humanities Athenaeum. Sometimes it takes a lot of time away from my duties on the desk, so I want to thank them very much. Today, we're going to be discussing Benjamin Franklin and the Virtuous Life. We'll be focusing our discussion on a segment of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, wherein he undertook what he considers a bold and arduous project at arriving at moral perfection. We're going to be discussing the method that he devised for himself to achieve this moral perfection, and just what that means. Benjamin Franklin has the appellation sometimes of the first American or a new kind of person. And we might talk a bit about how that might be figured into his autobiography. What his autobiography reflects about him, the times, and what it is to be an American. How many of you have read any of the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin? <clears throat> I was not exposed to it till, um, my first American literature course in college, and I was a bit surprised that that was one of the first readings that we undertook in a literature course. But the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is considered one of the foundational texts of American literature. If I may quote the Dictionary of American History, Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin introduces the twofold nature of his text, commenting first that it will be a means for his son William to know the circumstances of my life, quote, but also that, quote, my posterity may find it fit to be imitated, some of his means of having emerged from the poverty and obscurity into which I was born and bred to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world. More than simply a memoir, the autobiography pre presents Franklin's conscious recognition of his place in history. More broadly, it serves as an illustration of the author's identification with the New Republic, the self-made man in the land of self-made men, and his desire to share that dream and achievement with his countrymen. In part one of his autobiography, Franklin outlines his own life, his, his youth, his adolescence, his emergence into independence. In part two is where he reflects back on the specific project that he undertook at the age of 22. Now granted, he's writing at the age of 79, remembering back at the age of 22, this project that he undertook to achieve moral perfection. As we go along today, ponder some of these questions. Is it possible to be a good citizen in our self-governing nation without first governing oneself? Can one be a free human being without self-command? Is self-command sufficient to induce the willingness to serve one's neighbors or one's community or country in the way that Franklin did? And as we discuss Franklin's virtues, which I'm going to put up on the screen in just a moment, what virtues would you add, delete, replace, clarify for us as 21st century Americans? Are they the same or would they be different? That's what we look to history to do. I don't know, those of you who haven't read a lot of history in its primary, as a primary source document, sometimes it can be very surprising how contemporary something written in the 18th century can be. Some things see a need for change, and some are still the same, as we as human beings are still the same. Um, 
We're going to hear first from Dr. Fierro with some information about Franklin, followed by Professor Brown. And then um, we're going to sort of just have a conversation. We'll take questions from the audience. I will throw out some questions as moderator, and we'll proceed in that way. First, though, I will put up the, the virtues. Okay. Franklin and the Virtuous Life. Rachel already touched on some of the points I made that I'm going to repeat and maybe explain a little bit more, but uh, let me start by saying Benjamin Franklin fathered an illegitimate child, some say with a prostitute, then married a woman who left, he left alone for months, even years on end. And this he did as he frolicked frantically with French women in Paris. One of his biographers suggests that this was more than just mild flirtations. Uh, Madame Brillon was one of those women. Uh, she was married, but Franklin wrote in a letter to her, and I quote, she promises to lead me to heaven along a road so delicious. So much for chastity. He confessed to her that he could not honor the commandment to not covet thy neighbor's wife. He stayed in his marriage to Deborah Reed because it was useful more than anything else, utility being an important virtue that Franklin did not list, but not really because he was in love with her. He called his wife frugal and industrious. She was virtuous. Uh, two of the virtues he lists are frugality and industry, but there was virtually no romance in their relationship, and more importantly, no sense of devotion. Uh, equally important, with his wife, he had two children, one of whom died at a young age of smallpox, but the other, Sarah, he had an affection for, but a very mercurial, up and down relationship. Uh, he seemed to lack devotion to her as well. So how can we discuss Franklin as a virtuous historical figure when he was an absent husband and father at best? 
at least that, that to me is an interesting question to ask. First of all, it should be noted that in his autobiography, and, and Rachel touched on this, he started it in 1771. And so Franklin, he states that uh, he is uh, setting out on a path to fulfilling these virtues at the uh, young age of 22 years old. This was in 1728. Uh, so at 22 years old, he's idealistic, perhaps even naive. Uh, he considered the carrying out of a virtuous life, as he put it, a project at arriving at moral perfection. Rachel alluded to that point as well. Also, he's relying on memory. He's looking back 43 years uh, when he began this project. By the 1770s, Ben Franklin, like many of the founding fathers, uh, he was concerned about his image. And uh, as one of his biographers has said, uh, this is Walter Isaacson, and a lot of the, what I'm presenting is drawn from him, but uh, Franklin was as concerned about the appearance of being virtuous as he was about being virtuous. His idea of virtue lies really not in his personal life, and this is really the point I want to make. It's more of a public virtue that really is built into the American character. As Rachel said, uh, Franklin is the quintessential American in so many ways, and that's why we, we study him and learn about him. But he was most interested in how the individual promoted his or her own virtue for the sake of the country. So it was not a personal virtue at all. And certainly he fell short in his personal behavior. Ben Franklin believed America was uniquely positioned to be a virtuous country, just because of its composition, its makeup. It was heavily dominated in his time by the middle class, which was the instrument by which the nation could become virtuous. Uh, compared to the United States, England, for instance, at the same time, only 15% of the British population, roughly speaking, was middle class. By contrast, America had the largest middle class in the world, and this included uh, shopkeepers and small farmers, merchants, artisans of one kind or another, journeymen who had a very strong independent streak in them. And conditions were ripe in the United States for them to be independent. They wished to be left alone to do their business, these middle class people. America has the highest standard of living at this time. In fact, some historians would even say that America's standard of living in the 18th century is at its height, uh, not seen before or since. Donald Miller, historian called the 18th century American Society of Independent Money Makers, where laws, regulations, and institutions did not get in the way of people's success, get in the way of people obtaining personal wealth. Only in America, Franklin believed, could average people shape the national character through their virtues. Franklin's father, the Puritan, had preached to him the gospel of getting to heaven, but Franklin was more interested in the gospel of getting ahead. In this sense, Franklin represents the classic transformation from Puritan to Yankee. Uh, he tried his hardest to shed his Puritan ways, but a lot of these virtues that you see were based on his Puritan foundation at the same time. He was extremely hardworking. He was thrifty, industrious, moderate in temperament. As one historian has said, he, he was tenacious in his hard work. All virtues that will later become part of what is known as the Protestant work ethic. Ben Franklin's famous puns illustrate this point. It costs more to raise two children than to have one vice. Early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You've probably heard of that one. A penny saved is a penny earned. And I like this one. Nothing but money is sweeter than honey. Uh, these are all Franklin puns that probably sound familiar to us today. But for Franklin, money was not the end in and of itself. It was a means to an end. When independent laborers were allowed to pursue their own financial interests, free of government interference, they could then devote themselves to civic causes. That would lead to the general improvement of society and therefore the country. It was nothing like some modern day capitalists, for instance, who consider monetary gain as part of the end game and sacrifice public virtue on the altar of avarice and greed. Benjamin Franklin, in his own words, considered himself a doer of good. In fact, he published some of his early works in newspapers under the pseudonym Silence Do Good. Silence being 
Franklin's second virtue. Engagement in civic activity for the improvement of the community shapes Franklin's idea of virtue. In Philadelphia, he first established what was called the Organization for Mutual Improvement, whose members he encouraged to assist with the creation of several civic-minded activities, uh, like the uh, creation of America's first circulating library, fire insurance organization, a city hospital, and a city college, which later becomes the University of Pennsylvania. A civically engaged community created stability and order, which is also listed as one of his virtues. So urban order, in particular, could be maintained without a police force and without government rules and regulations put in place. It was always best when citizens, responsible citizens, handled their own situations at the local level, as far as Franklin was concerned. So for Ben Franklin, virtue meant, above all, how men comported themselves in public. Each virtue he lists serves a public function as much as a private one. The first several in particular clearly uh, could make for a better society, if not for a better marriage. It's interesting, his 12th virtue, which initially, as Rachel said, was his last, uh, he doesn't pay much attention to. He doesn't explain anything about it beyond uh, the mere description of it. And uh, one would wonder what he would have to say about it if he were pressed on it, but there's not much mention of it beyond what's listed. So he saves chastity for last and never mentioned it again. It is interesting uh, that when looked upon in terms of family obligation, uh, Franklin's virtues don't make much sense. Uh, he and virtues don't mix. To me, Franklin's private behavior seems inc incidental to uh, the virtuous life. Yet from Franklin's own perspective, and from the point of view of the late 18th century founding fathers generally, virtue had less to do with personal family relations than it did with building the national character. The driving force behind Ben Franklin's thinking was that America was a middle-class society that could use its tremendous wealth potential for the public good, which could then make for better citizens, would in turn make the country better. It wasn't just Franklin who believed in this concept, this national concept of virtue, by the way. Uh, George Washington, for instance, said, Virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. So Washington was among the first to connect virtue with the national consciousness. And Jefferson had a lot to say about virtue as well, even though he and Franklin often didn't see eye to eye on, on some things. Jefferson quotes Montesquieu, the French philosopher, who said, in a republic, virtue may be defined as the love of the laws of our country as such, love requires a constant preference of public to private interest. It is the source of all private virtue. This is, again, Jefferson quoting Montesquieu. And again, Jefferson, when virtue is banished, ambition invades the minds of those who are disposed to receive it, and avarice possesses the whole community. James Madison, to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical, an imaginary idea. And we return to Franklin. Only a virtuous people, he said, are capable of freedom. As nations become more corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. And finally, one of the more well-known of Benjamin Franklin's quotations, sell not virtue to purchase wealth, nor liberty to purchase power. Uh, this last quotation serves as a reminder that in our society today, wealth often is bought at the expense of virtue. I think we've lost sight of what virtue actually means, which might explain a lot of the greed and corruption in business and in politics. And power is accepted at the expense of liberty. We would do well to emulate Franklin in this regard, even though he certainly was in need of uh, marriage counseling. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I think I'd like to begin by contrasting Franklin with another one of the founders, uh, someone with whom he had uh, 
intimate relationship for much of his life. I mean, intimate in the sense of working on the same projects, overlapping um, um, documents, um, missions to Europe to secure the support of the French during the American Revolution, and also to Belgium to secure the financial support of America. Uh, the Belgian bankers who largely financed America's war for independence. Uh, the founding father of 200 for eight is John Adams, the second president of the United States. John Adams is, uh, I, I will confess up front, uh, John Adams is the one that I feel most attracted to. I like his prickly personality. I like his willingness to speak what he thinks. I like the fact that he's obsessed with his image. I like the fact that he is just so darn colorful in so many ordinary ways. As I, said, I talked about the lifetime relationship between Adams and Franklin, and which might lead one to think that they were close. They worked on the Declaration of Independence together. They were part of the committee that included Thomas Jefferson, uh, who actually put the document together that was submitted to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1776. They were on the same delegation that went to Europe. Uh, they uh, had constant interaction throughout their lives. At the end of their lives, however, uh, John Adams was asked to describe his relationship with Franklin, and he described it this way. That I have no friendship for Franklin, I avow. That I am incapable of having any with a man of his moral sentiments, I also avow. So it's pretty clear that in the end, Adams didn't much like Franklin. Now I had to give the, the other side equal play. Uh, Adams was one, Franklin was once asked what his opinion of Adams was. Uh, and he said that he thought that Adams means well for his country, is always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes and in some things absolutely out of his mind. So, you know, um, I think that Franklin's assessment of, of Adams is more generous than Adams' assessment of Franklin. But I also think that's because of the personalities of the two men. Adams really did think of himself and want to be a person of virtue. He truly did. It bothered him when he would sort of fall victim to jealousies. Uh, it bothered him when, when he would uh, think that uh, he deserved more credit than he was getting. He felt these things, but it bothered him. Uh, I don't think that those sort of things bothered Franklin over much, um, but I do think that they offer insight into Adams and Franklin. In particular, I think that the, the reason Adams developed this understanding of Franklin, this lack of appreciation, is because they were in Europe together. They were in Europe together during the American Revolution. Like I said, they were attempting to win the support of the French for our cause. They were successful in doing that. Uh, they were able to um, secure bank loans from the Belgian bankers. It was a successful mission. Uh, Adams was sick for most of the trip, and Franklin wasn't. And Franklin really loved being in Paris. Raphael talked about some of the things that he did. Yes, he flirted shamelessly. He was an old man by this time, and he had young women sitting on his lap in the evening at parties, and they would sort of whisper into his ear, and he would sort of laugh knowingly. Um, the, uh, what, what actually happened, I suspect, there was uh, even more than to that than met the eye, I agree with you, but it probably was. Franklin, uh, uh, Franklin liked to look, and I suspect that, that means he also at some point liked to touch. So, um, uh, the, uh, and yet, I think that, that Raphael makes a good point. There is a distinction between public virtue and private virtue. And I think that's clear in the minds of all the founding generation. Uh, and I think that the, perhaps the most telling example is this is a word that we, I'm going to give you a word that we misuse all the time. I'm going to try to capture the original historical meaning of it. The word is disinterested. Today, when people say, I'm disinterested, it means, oh, yawn, I could care less. To them, though, it meant something very real. It meant capable of setting aside one's selfish personal interest to do good for the nation, for the community, for the institution in question. Setting aside, divesting yourself of your interest and reaching judgments that might violate your own selfish interest for the sake of a greater good. And it's, it's quite telling that uh, in seven, when Jefferson, I mean, when, uh, when Franklin in the 1750s, um, was in the process of amassing his fortune. I should tell you at one point, he was probably the richest man in the colonies. He was a shrewd investor. Uh, he was, um, he got himself appointed, I guess, the equivalent uh, in the colonial structure to the position of postmaster general. Uh, he was a printer in Philadelphia, roughly the middle of the country, and 
and, um, and the postmaster generalship was a very lucrative thing. Um, but at the time that he was making his wealth and developing a public reputation in Philadelphia, uh, the um, leaders of the Philadelphia militia, the sort of you know, the voluntary association dedicated to the defense of Philadelphia in case of attack from others, approached him about becoming their colonel, which would have been making him first in command. It's a great honor, and Franklin turned it down. And he turned it down saying, I haven't made my fortune yet. It's possible that I would make decisions based on my need to acquire my personal fortune. When I get there, I can set it aside, ask me again. And they asked him again 15 years later, and he said yes. And wasn't going to use this position to benefit himself. He couldn't accept it until he thought that he had already benefited himself enough, and thus was able to give disinterested public service. Now, this is an entirely different understanding of politics from what we have today. I think, you know, that was, you know who runs for office, who, who gets himself wealthy and then gives it up and runs for office. You, know, uh, you run for office, you get yourself wealthy, and then you retire to become a lobbyist. Um, but um, but that's, uh, I, that's a different attitude, and I think it does speak to Franklin's perception of uh, public morality. I have to tell you, looking at the 13 virtues, too, uh, it brings me face to face with another aspect of Franklin. I do find endlessly fascinating. And that's, I think he's in many ways the most modern of the founding fathers. He's the one who speaks to us in, in language we can most understand, which is to say, I'm never quite sure whether he's pulling my leg or not. I don't know the extent to which he means these things or the extent to which he thinks them. Um, because he hides his intentions behind so many different layers and masks. Um, the, 12 virtues, of the, the essay, 13th virtue there. Uh, humility, um, imitate Jesus and Socrates. If you read the section of his autobiography that deals with virtue, that deals with the last virtue, humility, he says, that's the toughest one for me to overcome. And I think if I truly am able to achieve humility, that will be the thing of which I am proudest. Which of course is not what a humble person feels. I, he's always playing with me, I think, and, and I think that that's, uh, uh, that is part of his appeal. Uh, I'd also point out that uh, Silence Do Good, the pseudonym under which he wrote, his, early, his earliest journalism, uh, he wrote it for a publication that his, um, his, uh, his brother published uh, in, in Boston. And basically his brother went away for a period of time and Franklin assumed the editorship and basically started concocting these letters from Silas, uh, Silence Do Good. First of all, Silence Do Good is a woman. I mean, Franklin's a man, but he's writing as a woman. And second of all, if you read them, basically it's gossip. You know, he can say things behind people's backs, not them not knowing that it's Franklin who's doing the writing. Uh, he can say more freely than he can if he has to say, here's what I think about you. He can put the words in the mouth of someone else who's really himself. Um, I, uh, I like the section in his biography, autobiography that I think it is to uh, this sort of public-private distinction that, he, uh, that Raphael so correctly points out. Uh, Franklin decided at one point in his biography, he said he decided he was going to become a vegetarian because it's wrong to eat meat because that involves the sacrifice of another life. Then he talks about how he was walking along the wharfs in Philadelphia one day, and he was looking at the fish, and he was smelling the, 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 the wares that the, uh, the, the, um, the fishmongers were, were, were preparing to, uh, to sell, and, and, and this sort of lust for meat overcame him. And he said, he resolved to resist, but then as he stood and watched the fishermen um, unload their wares, he realized what they do, the first thing they do, of course, is they got the fish. It open. And Franklin couldn't help but notice that in the belly of the largest fish was another fish. And then if you open that fish up, you will find another fish on down the food chain. And he figured, well, if fish can eat each other, I can surely eat meat. And that's how he talked himself out of being a vegetarian. And I think that's a pretty good sort of ratiocination of, of something that, uh, that he didn't particularly want to do in the first place. Um, he, I think he listed uh, chastity 12th because, and last, because chastity is a very private virtue. I do think that he's drawing that distinction between
Um, he um, was committed to the people of Philadelphia and ultimately to the cause of independence. But there was a time in the early years of the American Revolution when his, I guess you'd call it patriotism, was doubted by some because he was playing a, many, many games. He was trying to win rec uh, diplomatic recognition from France. Uh, he was trying to convince the British to settle our uh, disagreements amicably. He was trying to shape British policy and French policy and, uh, and Belgian policy and bank policy and so many things that inevitably he gets himself caught up in contradictions. And I think that the message here is leading the virtuous life, even publicly virtuous, is sometimes very difficult because you find yourself chasing competing obligations and demands. Um, he um, had an illegitimate son. Yes. His illegitimate son became governor of New Jersey. Uh, his son, William, chose during the American Revolution to become a Tory, to retain his loyalty to Great Britain. He moved to Great Britain. Franklin broke his relationship with his son, son that he dearly loved, I think. And he did it because he thought his son had betrayed a country and a cause, as well as a person. I think that that's perhaps the most telling example I can think of indicate that, yeah, when it came to Franklin, what he's talking about when he's talking about virtue is public virtue. I want to close with a couple of observations on, on Franklin's attitude toward religion, which we frequently sort of co-mingle with virtue and values and all that. Um, Franklin grappled with religion. He grappled with religion for much of the early years of his life. He grappled with God for most of the early years of his life. He couldn't figure out what he believed. And he worked through a series of very sort of Franklin-esque um, intellectual exercises. At one point, he would believe that there was a personal God of the earth. And probably above that God, there was a personal God of the solar system. And ultimately, in the end, there's a, person, there, there's a God of the universe. But then he decided that didn't make much sense to him. And I think it is most comfortable and mature thinking about religion. He is what we would call a deist. Someone who believes in an impersonal universe, a universe created by a supreme being, but then the supreme being basically leaves it to operate by itself. The supreme being establishes the rules, the, the, the gravity, the function, the ways in which the world operates, and then leaves it alone. Uh, to many people uh, who were deists at this time, and, and most of the founding fathers I would submit were, um, the image that comes to mind is of the divine clockmaker. The clockmaker develops a clock, winds the clock up, and the clock runs itself. But Franklin never stopped believing in the value of religion. He might not believe in a personal God, but he believed intensely in religion because he believed that religion taught value. Religion taught civic value. Religion taught us how to behave to one another. And it was very important for people to go to church, not to necessarily venerate a personal God about whom he frankly had his doubts, but because it was good for society. I think that's perhaps the most telling example of, uh, of, of, sort of Franklin's fixation with, with what is public morality. Um, like I said, he infuriates me sometimes. He's colorful. Uh, he, I think, is capable of deceit. Uh, I think he gets himself caught in contradictions. But I think he does value very much those virtues that he lists here, except for probably the one about chastity. Um, and I look back at his life, and it's an imperfect life. But so many lives, everybody's life is imperfect. And if you take him as a whole, like I said, he can sometimes infuriate you. But I remember what the, 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 the writer George Orwell once said about uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He said, he can be infuriated, he can be maddening in a sense of superiority. But in the end, I have to say, compared to every other world leader I knew, what a clean scent he leaves behind. And that's sort of the way I feel about Frank when I confront him, as I do when I read the autobiography, which, by the way, my American Live One students had to read, too. So thank you very much. Thank you. This may be a good time to see if you have any questions in the audience before I start feeding them questions. Um, I hope this has brought up some questions or comments in your minds for our panelists, for me, 
or Franklin will try to answer on his behalf. <laughs> Anyone? Yes. Well, you want the mic? You guys say uh, you guys seem to have a uh, um, sort of sort of seen as Bertram Chastity is almost contradictory in his well the way he lived. Um, would you mind zooming back in on that definition? Sure. This is his definition of the Bertram, correct? Correct. He says. draw a useful distinction. Yes. I really do. And I would go further and say, I think this also gets back to one of the points I think both of us attempted to make about, about Franklin, which is the masks that he wears, the, 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 the precision with which he chooses his words when he wants to. Now, we read it one way, he says rarely. This allows him to step back and say, well, hey, I rarely did it. You know. Um, but I think that I think that, that you know he's, he's very very guarded in what he does, and I think that that's that's a very good point. Yeah, I, the other question that comes to mind is you know again the issue of memory. He's writing at a much later time than the age that is contemplating. So uh, I'm wondering if in his own mind he had guilty feelings about his marriage by the time he writes his autobiography. And so he, he shapes the definition according to what happens later in his life, not being all that devoted to his wife. So, uh, but you know, I think Bob is a good point. He kind of you're, you're, justifies himself after the fact. Yeah, you could say that. I uh, think I think you were wise to, to point out that, that that one word is very, uh, if I may say, Clinton-esque. And I want to get yeah, yeah, so I'm going to talk about that one. I would say that this is a very lawyerly phrase. You know, a, a, a making distinction, drawing a distinction that we perhaps don't see. And as I told my government and U.S. History two classes uh, to go back to Clinton, I'll be able to pick it up at that point. Um, Bill Clinton is a the only person who doesn't think he has sex with Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> okay, and B, he's the only person I can think of who's ever been president who could, in response to a question asked by the special prosecutor, actually responded by saying, it depends on how you define the word is. You know, these are distinctions that most of us don't see, but I think Franklin, yeah, I think you're, you're onto something there. My students in US 645, one of the assignments I'm having them do is to compare Franklin to a modern day figure in terms of virtue. How we see it, Bill Clinton might make a lot of sense because it's just interesting that you know, when the Republicans pursued this impeachment of Clinton over the Monica Lewinsky affair and the public uh, proceedings that were associated with it, they just got so frustrated that nothing seemed to stick, right? That no matter what he did, he always found a way to get around it, and it just frustrated them to no end. But I think what they didn't get, and what their supporters didn't get, is this distinction between public and private virtue. Uh, you know, uh, many who supported Clinton said something to the effect, I could care less what he does in his private life as long as his policy is out. And I think if we could somehow bring Franklin back to life, it, it might very well be informed Bill Clinton. Can you, uh, can you, uh, can you talk about this issue of values versus virtues? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, we, we can come back to that. Okay. I think that sort of speaks to some elements. Yeah, you're right. Is there other questions? Really well. Thanks. Anyone else? Now you spoke of um, disinterested, uh, basically putting aside of your personal interest or basically just saying no. Uh, would you say like that would be like main the problem that we have in our politics today? Because if we were able to see how Adams and, and Franklin were able to get along, even though they didn't like each other, you know, they still came together for a common goal, which was 
might be a better place. Now, my question to you is, is there some of the problems right then and there if we can't seem to come to that realization? We just can't work together, work together because our interests are just so different. And it was Franklin on to something by being able to work with somebody even though, and have the same time, work with somebody even though they were on two totally different places. I think that, um, yeah, I think one thing that, that is remarkable about Franklin is, like I said, his ability to pursue many paths to the same objective. <coughs> and uh, and that's what led him to sort of be attempting to negotiate with the British while negotiating with the French and while cutting the bank deal with the Belgians, you know, and, and uh, the whole European uh, exercise. And I think that, yeah, that re he, was, he saw a target. He knew what needed to be done and he was willing to explore a variety of different paths to work with a variety of different people to do that. And he could do so in the absolute certainty, I think, and this is, and this is, the, a, a, this is, this is the major change, I think, in uh, American conception of, of, of politics, and we can trace it back to the 1820s and 1830s, I think, when politics becomes all about interest, uh, and it still is today. But I think, yes, you know, the Franklin would in some ways be very under recognizable to modern people because of his personality, but I think he would be absolutely unrecognizable as a public figure. Because I don't think that he would do that. I think that, that so much of politics today is about interest. And I'm not I'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is certainly a reality that explains, I think, a, a lot of the gridlock and you know, a lot of the difficulties that the political parties have agreeing on just about anything. Even though if you look at the areas where they disagree, by and large, they're not that I mean, you have extremists on issues like abortion and guns and whatnot. But on, on the essential issues, you know, the primary issue in the big tax fight of 2012, last year, was um, whether to raise taxes on a very small segment of American people or not. Uh, not a great big difference, but one that was certainly big enough to make for a really sort of interesting political theater in much of the past year. So, yeah. The, the differences get inflated, and they do become, they are about interest. I think also, if you look at the Constitutional Convention, your point is well taken regarding that, because had it not been for Franklin, it, it could very well have been the, the compromise we reached there, either over slavery or uh, representation in, in Congress, in the House and Senate. It could very well have been that the Constitutional Convention ends in no breakthrough, no a consensus on what should be part of the new constitution. So in that sense, uh, Franklin was the great compromise. Um, uh, the other thing I want to mention is Michael's question and comment remind me of this. He, Bob mentioned he's, 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 he's familiar to us today. He's the most modern of our founding fathers. And I think that's true. And the way in which it's most true is the fact that he had the greatest egalitarian strain in him. He believed, probably more than any other founding father, that average people could make the country work. He had less of an elitist strain in him than any founding father. It's been noted that, for instance, Thomas Jefferson created the University of Virginia, and Franklin was most responsible for the University of Pennsylvania. If you look at those two institutions, Jefferson envisioned the University of Virginia to be this, this place where the elite could become educated and leave the country. The University of Pennsylvania was established uh, so that average people can have an opportunity to get educated and then rise up. And so I think that that uh, those two colleges in and of themselves is a, is, is a reflection of the egalitarian Franklin. And, and to us, I mean, I think that, that speaks to our sensibilities today. Jefferson has emerged in history, and I think, I think this is good. Rocky was absolutely right, has emerged in, in, in our historical understanding as the first great Democrat with a little D, because he built a mass public organization and, and all that. But but yeah, he was he was instinctively an aristocrat. And uh, I, I simply add this, um, uh, Rocky mentioned the University of Virginia, and I went there. And I can tell you, I'm hardly of the elite. So, uh, so you know, I didn't Jeff mean to suggest I know, that. I mean, Jeff Jefferson's vision died. You know. I'm proof. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. 
I think no direct role in that. I don't think uh, Franklin or Adams' view of women had, you know, what they did in their personal lives had much to do with directly with how the Constitution ends up. But I, you know, the 18th century is a very patriarchal age. And, you know, one of the more famous stories of the Constitutional Convention is Abigail Adams urging her husband John as he leaves for Philadelphia to remember the ladies. And he just kind of dismisses her. Now, now, Abigail, calm down, is basically what he says rather condescendingly for her. Um, and so it speaks to the 18th century view of women as subordinate. And I think both Franklin and Adams and others had this kind of patriarchal view of society where women was, were supposed to be seen and not heard. Um, and so they were hardly egalitarian in that sense by wanting to give women the right to vote. That's not even a conversation that takes place at the Constitutional Convention. I think that um, it's, it's, it's an interesting question that leads down a couple of pathways. Um, first, I, I point out that, uh, you know, yeah, the, they, they share the sort of patriarchal assumption about, um, about what men's dominant role in society. I'd also say, though, that, that it's clear if you, if you look at them and read them and study their lives a bit, that Franklin liked women. I mean, he obviously did. Uh, Adams was scared to death of him. He truly was. You know, he, uh, uh, Abigail had a good friend, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, and she used to like to invite Mercy Otis Warren to the house because Adams went absolutely tongue-tied around her. She thought he, he thought she was just so smart that he was afraid to say anything for fear of, you know, uh, for fear of looking like a fool. Uh, I think that's, um, that's, uh, that's an insight that, that uh, thank you for, for mentioning that. The other thing is, um, you know, lest we think that the 18th century, the 1700s, were all that different from our time, I point out that yeah, they had sex scandals too. They really did. Yeah, Alexander Hamilton um, uh, had a very public um, revelation of his affair with a with a woman who um, who came to him seeking help, and it turns out that probably she and her supposedly estranged uh, husband were engaged in an elaborate sort of blackmail scheme to sort of shake Adams Hamilton down. And Jefferson, of course, did have a relationship with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. Um, I would also point out that if you, there's a very good book on this subject called The Hemings is a Monticello. It's by um, a story named uh, Annette Gordon Reed. Uh, if you follow Sally Hemings, what you conclude is ultimately that Sally Hemings was the half sister of Jefferson's wife, who died when Jefferson was very young, or when, when, when she was very young, and Jefferson was very young too. So it was sort of a family deal. Things got very complicated sexually, and it just because, you know, we, we think we live in a sort of a, a less chaste age, I'm not sure we do. That there have always been issues around that. This might be a good time to point out too that um, the word virtue is originally a Roman concept, and um, the stem of the word is vir vir for man, and it was considered um, virtue was considered the masculine qualities that a man should have as head of household, and also in the public sphere. And we can talk a bit about that. Um, I think it's interesting that I'm glad this one's still up here. As a woman, uh, my virtue singular is essentially equated to my virginity, you know, we don't, <laughs> it's itself almost a sexist concept, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, going, oh yes, question. Um, I have a question, when do you, when do you think um, religion stopped being uh, a part of mainstream society, uh, or do you think that's a false concept? I think it's false comment, actually. I, I don't, if you look at polls, polls are not an exact indicator of what's happening in America, but uh, if you ask the question, do you believe in God, Americans are pretty, are pretty consistent, more than, slightly more than 90% of Americans are rough that we believe in God. Now, if the question is, you know, uh, where does the, I guess it would be more of like, like you pointed out, or I think Professor Brennan pointed out that um, 
Franklin believed in a god, but he believed in religion as well because it held the mainstream Americans together and it right. gave them a way to live their lives. Do you think that we still live our lives as a society in religion? In, in recent years, I do see that slowly unraveling. That's true. But if you look at American history, it's not a, a linear thing. In other words, it's not this downward slope mm -hmm. of this loss of religious uh, activity as, as a way of uh, making society cohesive. You've had fluctuations the first great awakening in the second. I mean, uh, Franklin's age was the age of Jesus in a lot of ways. But that was followed by the second great awakening, which is this huge push for evangelical Christianity. Uh, once every, you know, generation or so, there is a, a religious, religious country that, you know, kind of grabs society by the clutches and says, okay, it's time to get anchored down again. So I wouldn't necessarily see this downward slope. The, um, and in fact, as, as late as the, the 1970s, not the after effects, but the continuing effects of that. You get the emergence of the um, um, Christian right, you know, very fundamentalist uh, political or religious movement that feeds into politics in, in very direct ways. Uh, I would say that um, I think that I, the way I formulate it is if you ask most Americans, do you believe in God? Most of them will say yes. And I think on some level, without necessarily formalizing it, they're thinking about the personal God. They're thinking about the God that we go to church to worship, or we worship where we can, long talks about Boston mm -hmm. with, with nature. You know, and I think that the one difference is Jeff but Franklin believed in religion. He didn't believe in that God. He didn't believe that he went to church to honor and adore that God. Mm -hmm. He believed he went to church to learn good, solid values or virtues. Mm -hmm. so that the thing. Yeah. yeah, we've been playing with the idea of virtues versus values, it seems to me that uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, after the, the, the decline of Victorian culture, we cease talking about virtues as a, as a civilization, and we move to the word value, which is much more subjective and depending on one's frame of reference, uh, which leads to the concept called moral value. So what's moral for you may not be moral for me. It's a matter of personal judgment. Virtues are, are much more fixed, much more absolute, and you know, not to be too philosophical, but that kind of dictates the rest of the 20th century in so many ways. With this kind of era of non judgmentalism, this era of tolerance, and so on and so forth. Uh, that you know, I clearly see that in politics today, where it's hard to pinpoint where the truth is, where um, you know, politician X is valued, may not be politician Y is valued. And we all we all proclaim allegiance to the same values. Um, and uh, but what we mean by that is, is again open to interpretation. Yet even Franklin, as we've pointed out, in his precepts where he defines the virtue for himself, even he was doing that at the time, applying somewhat of a subjective interpretation, I would say, to the virtues. I would also say in regards to Raphael's comment that um, the religiosity or the basis of religion as formative in American government and politics has gone this type of uh, track. And Franklin, if you read the autobiography as literature, not just as actual personal history, because I do think he's embellished it and created it as a piece of literature, um, I think it's very symbolic that at 17, Benjamin Franklin ran away from his apprenticeship with his brother in Boston, the stronghold of Puritan values at the time, to Philadelphia, where then he started his new life. Maybe that's where he became the first American, with a more bourgeois, commercial um, frame of reference, rather than the Puritan one. So I do think that even he, at the time, um, and that's perhaps why Professor Brown says he's the most modern of the founders to us, um, that he does more represent, we've lost that Puritan stamp uh, on the culture. It does still exist in some ways. And perhaps now that we've, we have the entire culture, the country, and taken all of the influences, that perhaps if you think about all those, that it was not the only foundation for the foundation of the United States of America. It's, it's interesting because <coughs> you write about Boston and the city he fled to, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, was much more 
tolerant, the to most, use that word. The most, the most, the most cosmopolitan. <laughs> cosmopolitan. And more, more people from more different places in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was, uh, Pennsylvania was um, um, actually land given by the King of England, thought he could actually give away land to have a little play, uh, given to a Quaker, William Penn. And William Penn built into the principles of Pennsylvania tolerance, even of people who might not be tolerated otherwise, such as the native population. They had certain rights and liberties in Pennsylvania. So we have Philadelphia is a very different place from Boston. Any other questions? Okay. Um, going back to the virtues, maybe I'll zoom out a bit. interesting and I'd like to ask the panelists why do you think so many of these virtues he lists and the precepts are accompanied by guidelines for what he will avoid doing rather than guidelines for what he will do he makes a comparison in the autobiography and in section 2 to gardening to um, improving oneself and gaining self-command by weeding out the bad elements um, rather than he, and he seems to concentrate more on that aspect rather than what will I plant in myself, what will I cultivate in myself, and I was wondering what you thought about that. Well, this is just speculation on my part, but I think part of it is the Puritan orthodoxy. I think uh, the Puritans were very concerned about the things they might have done wrong, <laughs> the things to avoid doing, unless you know God uh, smite you. So I don't think especially at a young age, Franklin, although he wishes to escape his Puritan background, I don't think he's able to do that completely. Even as a Yankee, when he's transformed to Philadelphia, uh, he still has those Puritan roots from which he did not escape. And uh, I think that, that might be a, a possible way to survive the United States on the negative. Oh, looking at it, it's, it's an interesting point because I see one, two, uh, let's say seven, eight, I guess nine, avoid extremes, that's sort of in the negative. Powering no one from 10, 11, and with the equivocal exception of 12, you know, they're sort of playing around with the larger term there. Both of the majority of them are phrased in the negative. And um, it's um, interesting that uh, this is sort of a pattern that uh, is repeated in, in other forms of you know great rules for living like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Yeah. Now, the, the ones dealing with relationships between man and man, or man and woman, humans and humans, are phrased in the negative. The ones dealing with man and God uh, are by and large phrased in the positive, other than thou shalt have no idols. Thou shalt the word that God is all their lives. Right? So, you know, that is a thou shalt is a very clear command. But the others are negative. Western woman knows what not to do rather than what to do. Yes, Terry. Thanks, so I'm sort of uh, amused by your observation. I didn't read the uh, virtues and statements on the meeting that you did, which is really pretty insightful of you. But I was raised as a Catholic. And <laughs> Me this too. seems to me very consistent. <laughs> Just apt. Yeah. Very consistent with the way I was raised. I was raised a Southern Baptist, and I, I believe that I was probably going to burn in hell if I did anything wrong. Yeah, I'm agnostic on that one now. I'm, I'm hoping for the best. Yes, Marguerite? Was there any idea at the time that the Puritans were being Well, I think that's an interesting distinction too. I'm glad you mentioned that. That itself, for him to say um, that he would embark, he calls it bold and arduous, this project to achieve moral perfection. But for him to even think that he could is certainly not a pre Puritan, puritanical view um, that a human could achieve perfection. Um, and again, we don't know if it's his humor or not. When he says, "Well, I, you know, I did sort of have to give it up because I just couldn't be perfect," but. That in itself is very interesting historically, that for him to, in his mind, even again, he was a young man at 22, um, but to see that as a possibility, even for a short time, 
Interesting. Yes, we can show his plan. Yes. I don't know if you can still see it, but this is an actual um, page. He really is a very practical man, as Raphael said. He really had this method that he devised. <coughs> These are the first initial of his 13 virtues. These are the days of the week. He devised a, sim a system of 13 week cycles. He, he admitted that he would just probably be able to master one at a time, but he would take them in succession. So for this week, he was starting with number one, temperance. And for that week, he would, prefer, he would eat not to dullness and drink not to elevation, with the goal of having a clean slate for that whole week. And then at the end of, the, of each day of that week, he would make note, black marks. Again, he's, he's noting his failures for that particular week on, e on, on each particular virtue. So he would take the week, and then the next week, the top virtue would be silence, his next one. And he would aim for a clean slate there, and he would um, mark, give himself his black marks on the other virtues that he did not fulfill. It's interesting that he just, it seems like he just said he had a clean slate, and he had a clean slate. He really must have applied himself to not indulging or keeping that virtue for the week. And every 13 weeks, he said in the beginning, he resolved that he would go back to the top and start again. And then after a while, he decided, well, <laughs> this is hard work. Um, I'll do it twice a year. And then in the end, he decides, I'll do it once a year. And then he sort of, I guess, figures, well, I've done it often enough so that I've made myself as perfect as I'm going to be. And so he doesn't, from the time of his mature years on, actually indulge in it as a formal exercise. That's that's the way Franklin decided to achieve virtue. When I read that part of his autobiography, it compared it to a, a balloon that you're trying to squash, and as you try to squash one end, the other end inflates, because he became very frustrated by the fact that when he concentrated on one virtue and honoring that, when he concentrated on one virtue, honoring that one, he would uh, he would uh, fall short on another virtue, and it frustrated him. Uh, in reference uh, to your question, though, I, I think uh, for Franklin, uh, this uh, idea that uh, you know you could overcome your innate tendency to, uh, to you know to overcome your flaws, it, it kind of comports with his idea of America that that life was not fixed for anyone. You know, later on, it becomes known as this rags to riches motif that people can start at a very low point in American life, but become something. Franklin was really big on that, and you're right, it's not a very puritanical view whatsoever, and that's one case in which he escapes that puritanism. His work as a printer um, is kind of reflected in his thoughts about when he, his black marks that he gave himself, he considered those his errata. And, 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 and those of you, maybe our newspaper man can talk to us about errata. And errors that could be erased. That's basically it. Errata. It wasn't supposed to be there. It got in there by mistake. You know. And, and anybody who's ever written for a daily newspaper knows that nothing drives you crazy than the errata. That's basically it. Um, I, I wanted to point out one other thing that I think I think is amusing. You look at the list and you wonder which ones he'd have the most trouble with. Order. Order drove him crazy. He says that in the autobiography. He says it's amazing how things get cluttered. And those of you who have visited my office can see that I can relate to Franklin on a personal level. Ditto. Well, Bob, if, if that's true, uh, CH, I assume, means chastity. There are no dots there. Right. Well, I'm wondering who wasn't very attractive. I think he just didn't bother. Didn't bother. I didn't think he gave up entirely on that one. <laughs> it might have been a bad That's right. You know, what, one of his biographers actually says the flirtations he had in France were never fully consummated. I'm not even sure exactly what that means. Uh, I suppose... I can I, tell I'm you very, after. I'm, <laughs> I'm very naive when it comes to that. But never beyond kissing, I think, is what was meant by that. 
And so in his view, it depends on what your definition of the word is, is that wasn't sex, that was, there was nothing wrong with it. So maybe in that lens, he, he fulfilled that. And in doing that, that he also virtue. obviously fulfilled the virtue of restraint. Right. That's sort of a two for you. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention earlier, um, Bob uh, pointed out his relationship with his son, William. Uh, his son, William, also fathered an illegitimate child and then kind of distanced himself from his son. And then Franklin uh, became a mentor to, to the grandchild and raised him pretty much throughout his young life. And, and I, I think for Franklin, the father, Benjamin, uh, there was this uh, sense of duty that uh, that although he, he was very flawed when it came to family relations, there was a, a public persona that he had to take care of, of this child. And yeah. So I thought that was interesting. And, and, and this, uh, the, the, the grandson's name was Benjamin. And um, yeah, he uh, basically raised Benjamin up to be a printer, like Franklin had been. Yeah, he, um, and and uh, his grandson, Benjamin Bache, became a uh, became a Bosch, B A C A G became um, one of the leading printers in the in, in the new nation after after independence, not in the early 19th century. Did you have a question? No. So I did ask earlier for everyone to think about: Is it? important or is it imperative for those of us in a republic in a democratic nation to have self-command to be good citizens and is that what franklin was getting at do you think I don't, what, I having don't yourself self-command meaning having being a vir living a virtuous life um i was when i when i read the term self-command and, and um, i thought of since baseball season's right around the corner. The pitchers, they have control and command. And so in applying that kind of theory to self-control, whereas you have all your vices <clears throat> under control, restrained, as opposed to command where you're really just, you have perfect command of what you can do when you do do it, um, knowing the right thing to do, knowing the right time to do it, really command over yourself rather than self-control. Uh, I do think that's what Franklin was aiming at. Um, but do you think, I mean, there's been a few questions from the audience. I think we all do sort of feel perhaps the lack of this type of thinking about oneself. Um, and do you, do you think it's important in our type of representative Republican government to have that, do you think we'd be better served? And do you think that's what Franklin was getting at? No, you're asking the panel. Yes. Okay. And the, or the audience. Or the audience. Uh, actually, I, I do. I, I think what's most interesting about modern society in some ways is, is the, the lack of self-reflection that we have on these things at all. How many of you have taken the time to think about your virtues and, and you know, uh, the ability to have uh, command of ourselves? I think in, in modern day America in particular, uh, there's this, this desire to look outward at what others can do for us, what, the, you know, what, what government's role is in society, rather than to look at ourselves. I think one of the distinguishing features of the Founding Fathers is that they put the emphasis and the burden on the American people. And I think to some extent we've lost that sense. Um, uh, one of the other famous stories about Benjamin Franklin is right after the Constitutional Convention was over, a, a woman waited outside the Constitution Hall and, and, and asked Ben Franklin, what have you given us? And, and he responded by saying, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. In other words, in the end, the responsibility is ours to make the republic work. It's not the responsibility of the president or members of Congress it's uh, up to the individual American and how we relate to society. I mean, Ben Franklin comes from a, a world in which community was everything. You know, it mattered more than your own family. I think it's quite clear that for Franklin that was the case. 
it was much more beneficial to society to have a, a mutual improvement society to help your fellow citizens than it was to be with your wife, even though she needed you there. By the way, his wife never left Market Street once they lived there. She spent her entire life not leaving that street. But Franklin was cosmopolitan, still had the sense of duty to community. And I don't know that we have that anymore. It seems like these ideas, these grand notions of government have replaced this sense of local community and what that means to us. I, I think that that's, that's, that's certainly true. Uh, but I, I'd like to sort of take the question in another direction a little bit too. Uh, I have been fascinated for several years now about the connection between private and public, about the connection between um, how one lives one's life and the extent to which one feels in control and command of one's life. And I will say this, I, 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 my thinking has led me to one conclusion. Uh, the only time that I think that people perhaps reflect on their ability to master themselves as individuals, to have self-command, to achieve self-control, is by seeing that you've lost it. If you see that you have given it up and you realize that, then that's the first step toward recovery. And I think that that's a very big, that's a, it's a very useful way to, at least for me, to look at the whole issue of self-command and self-control. That, uh, that, you know, realizing what you have, realizing the, the, the person you have become as opposed to the person you were or wanted to be is actually the first step on the road to making yourself, once again, the person you want to be and achieving a measure of redemption, I think. So, you know, on a personal level, it, that's sort of different focus but, but the, the two, than, than Raphael gave it, but on a personal level, yeah, I've been, I've been interested in this, that topic of um, achieving mastery of oneself for, for a good while now. And, uh, and I think that, that um, it, one good way to do it is, is actually to adopt our little chart here, you know, see, try, try maybe to do them all at once or maybe two in one week, but you know, um, sort of to, to establish a set of measures for yourself. So. As a, as a guide in the practical life, I also think it has utility to our conversation one in another direction. I would concur with Bob. I, this chart made me think of in my own life now, and even now in the 21st century, with so many services now on the web where you can input your daily calories, you can input your exercise for the day. People are finding that keeping track, whether in their own little notebook, or through a web service, either free or paid, is helping them achieve their goals. Of course, it's very much in our 21st century, you know, being fit and eating healthy, because that's, that's what we're all about these days. But uh, perhaps <laughs> we could go, uh, there's a startup for you, um, Franklin's Virtue Notebook. Actually, if you are interested, you can actually download the form that Franklin uses here, if you want to use this in your own life. Um, yeah. It's a free, yeah, it's a free, actually it's just a free, you free download the file and you can fill it in with your own virtues or you can use Franklin's virtues. Um, you know, I don't, let's see if I can find the website quickly. Otherwise you can certainly stop by or email me and I'll get you that. It's really kind of funny and it prints out exactly like if you have a little file of facts, which I don't think anybody has anymore, but um, so you can introduce this into your own life if you'd like. Are there any other questions before we wrap it up? It's been a very fertile discussion. We've had some really great questions. Yes. No? Okay. <laughs> really appreciate you all being here. Uh, we hope we'll see you at our next forum, perhaps in the fall. Uh, thank you so much. Happy spring, everyone. Take care. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Professor Brown, Dr. Piero. Thank you, Mike Zisch, for taping us and meeting our every need.